next presenter is David Workman. Good to see you, David. Yes, thank you. And David is going to be talking about uh, the uh, embryonics SOC and 2110. Yeah, very good. Take so is this just uh, That's it. Press the green button. All right, very good. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How's everybody doing? <laughs> so I, I was thinking back on I started in this business in the, in the broadcast equipment supply in early 80s, 1983. So that was like, yeah, 40 years ago, I want to say. Um, but at the time, everything was composite analog or PAL, you know, NTSC or PAL. Um, exactly the, the, the signal that was produced in the studio went directly to the transmitter tower and was transmitted and it was, you know, pretty much no fuss. We had a little bit of a sidetrack along there with um, uh, component analog. Um, out of a beta SP player, you had your Y, R minus Y, B minus Y, uh, and then we went to the, you know, the first digital formats. Um, we had a, a little sidetrack with composite digital, uh, you know, and then we went to the component digital, and, and a lot of people actually did a very large investment in um, composite digital. In fact, when I was working at Grass Valley, our, our CEO got up in front of the company and said, you know, the future of this industry is composite digital because component digital is just too expensive. And <laughs> we, we, you know, see where that, where that goes. When you, when you think of SDI today, you think of component digital. You don't even, don't even consider in your head that, you know, the composite digital was once a, a major format. Uh, and then we went from standard def to high def. You know, that was basically just a faster bit rate of um, component digital. The, and the one thing about all of these transitions is that the, the signal that you went from point to point was always just a piece of coax. Um, it, you know, if you wanted to s send your camera signal to your router, you ran a, a Genlock signal and a, and a piece of coax back and, it, you know, it was, was relatively simple. You didn't have to worry, much as I love John Naylor's presentation yesterday, you didn't have to worry about anybody trying to hack into your Genlock signal. <laughs> um, so, so this transition has been very, very difficult now going to 2110 because it is very fundamentally different than all the other transitions that we've gone through in the past. And most of the information that we're talking about here in this, in, you know, over, the, over these days has been kind of a global overall uh, technology change. But the, the point that, the reason why I'm here is there's also a difficulty for the manufacturers. And the manufacturers themselves have a hard time a lot, in a lot of cases uh, implementing 2110 interfaces into their equipment. Um, so, the technology that I'm going to be talking about is the um, EB82 SOC1, the system on chip that Embryonics has developed. And this is kind of a how-to guide for manufacturers themselves on, um, on implementing this into their product and integrating it into the product. So this is an OEM part that's exclusively available to equipment manufacturers and just provides a simplified way to add that interface without having to um, sit through every single one of Wes Simpson's classes and, you know, <laughs> and really learn all of these details and implement everything individually. So we're going to look at the internal architecture um, and kind of do the, the how-to guide for both the hardware integration and the software integration and then some systemization things uh, and then I'll talk about the evaluation board and, and the, the mechanical issues that, uh, that come along with it. So at a, at a high level um, architectural view, uh, we have your, your serial SDI, series pairs, one, two, three, and four. There's eight total SDI signals that come into and out of the device. These can be encapsulators or de-encapsulators. Internally, there's a redundant network switch, so you have your true red-blue ST2022-7 redundancy, and then your network output. You know, for, so from a high level standpoint, it's relatively simple. You have your SPI control. Um, the, um, whoop, that was supposed to be laser. Uh, the, the ports can be either 10 gig or 25 gig ethernet, and that actually sets the ethernet rate and the clock rate of the device itself. So when you have the application that's running at 10 gig ethernet, everything inside the FPGA is running at 10 gig clock rate. And when you have the 25 gig ethernet, everything inside is running uh, 25 gig. So um, when you look then into the details of those encapsulators and de-encapsulators, 
So for each of those encapsulator channels, um, I keep hitting the uh, forward button instead of the laser pointer, um, you know, your, your SDI signal comes in, you demux it because you have video, you have your audio, you have your ancillary data. That's demuxed from the SDI signal. It's all tied to your PTP. Um, the, the frame sync and the audio sample rate, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, coming up. These then go over to get time stamped. You, you create the streams for your video encapsulation, your audio encapsulation, then your ancillary data, you know, 20, 30, and 40. Then you have the 2022-7 uh, processing and then your network output. Um, on the de-encapsulation, it's kind of the same, you know, reverse of that. Your network inputs, your 2022-7 processing. Um, for the video side, you have your clean switching and then the actual de-encapsulation, audio de-encapsulation, audio uh, channel mapping, data de-encapsulation, those all get muxed together back into an SDI stream and then you have your SDI output. So again, that's repeated for each of those eight signals that you have inside the, the device itself. Um, for the electrical connections, the, the CERDES, uh, the, the SDI IO are all 100 ohm, 75 millivolt differential AC coupled signals. Um, so when you do go to a traditional 75 ohm uh, SDI output, you must have that cable driver, and I'll show a schematic of that in a few minutes. You have your power, your reset signal, and then the SPI bus, and that really is all of the electrical connections that need to be made to the, um, to the device itself. So the form factor, um, I've actually got the little, little chip here. It's, it's, it's always a lot smaller than people think it will be, so I um, wanted to actually show you, you know, it's about, about the size of your pinky. A very small device uh, with, you know, with a, with a very simple connection. Um, the connector pinout, I don't want to go into the details of it, a bit, but again, you know, like I said, I, I kind of outlined all of the I.O. and all the pins out they, that, that go with it. The 25G differential signal handling, anybody who's, who, who works with SDI and has designed equipment, you know, probably knows all of this already, but just as, you know, just, just proper engineering, proper signal handling of your signals as they go back and forth, uh, matching the impedance, uh, um, uh, matching your lengths of your, of your traces, things like that. Um, and uh, we will do a um, design review to help, you know, ensure that you have minimum crosstalk, things like that, uh, as, you know, uh, to, to do a final review of the design for our OEM partners. So putting it all together, um, traditionally most of the, the uh, manufacturers that are integrating this into their equipment, you know, they have their own core competency, their own pro core product, whether it's a camera base station, a graphic system, a disc playout, an encoder, you know, video or audio monitor, whatever, whatever their internal processing of their equipment is that has SDI processing internally, then it goes into the EB82 SOC1, um, your primary and secondary outputs, your SPI, and then you can, you can send all of that out to a um, SFP cage and, uh, you know, and that gives you your interface to the outside world. Um, if you do want to have, instead of all of your SDI signals internally here, um, you can also do the SDI signals out to the, the 75 ohm. And, and again, um, this is mostly just to, to remind everybody because we've had so many so many of the OEM partners that don't realize that you don't that that there is no cable driver built into it that um, that you do need to have the SDI cable driver or the SDI equalizer on the on the inputs and outputs. These can be with reclocker, without reclocker, 3G, 12G, whatever whatever signal formats you want to handle. We don't specify or recommend any specific um, uh, technology for that. So you need to do your filtering based on whatever the chipset the chipset specifications are. Um, so that's kind of, that's kind of the, the bulk of it for the hardware integration. The software integration options, a lot of the OEM uh, manufacturers that we deal with uh, want this to be completely hidden so when they sell a, a video monitor or a teleprompter or you know, disc recorder or whatever, they want it to look like their equipment. That, and that means all of the software interface and everything else wants to look like their branded, their UI. And um, so when you use the rest over SPI, you can have that integrated into 
whatever, whatever host application you already have, and it's just, it just becomes a part of, that, uh, um, part of that UI. So everything can look like the manufacturer's product. Um, you can also, if you don't want to do that much work, it can be a partial integration. Um, there is a web interface built in to this, so you can use the web interface to do software updates and, and things like that. Um, and then there is the, the Embryonics um, MN set uh, control software, um, which, which means that the, the, the manufacturer has to do the least amount of work to integrate this into their product. Um, and, and you know everything can be done then with that prepackaged um, uh, UI. Um, we will have white labeling available in that next uh, version of the MN set, so you know so that the OEM partners can um, redistribute that software with their own branding and you know still have it kind of look like their their own product. Um, you know, just a, a re-verification of all the standards, compliance, and control options. Again, you have all of your PTP. Um, traffic shaping is kind of an interesting um, uh, topic. I don't think that we've really uh, touched on that in any of the other sessions. Usually when you're coming from anything that is FPGA-based, you're going to have your packets coming on a very nice, consistent, even uh, pacing coming out of the device. But when you're coming from a... Um, PC or other software-based devices, those are going to those are going to be a bit bursty, and um, uh, you know. So if, if you need to turn on that buffer to accommodate for the for the wide gapped bursting, that is also going to impact your uh, your propagation delay. Um, you know, so there are some trade-offs there, but uh, but again, just to you know say we 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 accommodate all of those different scenarios uh, in the device. And then all the different NMOS control, ISO 4, 5, 8, whatever, you know, the, those are all uh, uh, standard in the, in the product. Um, systemization considerations, um, again, as, as you probably all know, ST2110 requires all video to be gen locked to, or locked to the PTP as it goes onto the network. Um, in most, in, in most studio uh, situations, sure, everything inside the studio is already locked and gen locked and it's no problem, but occasionally uh, you always have this one external feed coming in that's coming in from somewhere else, from a satellite, from wherever, and it's not locked. Um, so the system on chip has a frame sync built into it, uh, but when you do use that, of course, just the very nature of any kind of frame sync, you're always going to introduce a frame of delay. Um, I mentioned before on that, on that previous slide uh, that there's an audio sample rate converter. So that's not a generic sample rate converter to do like 44.1 to 48K audio sample rate. That is basically just to keep the track of your incoming clock rate of the incoming video to the PTP clock rate of your, of your genlocked video. Those are gonna be running at slightly different, different frequencies. Well, the video, just occasionally when it gets to one frame off or if, if the incoming video is faster or slower, you can drop a frame of video or, or, or a repeat a frame of video and it's fine, but you can't do that with the audio. So the audio is consistently being reclocked from the one frame rate to the other frame rate so that it's a very consistent time stamped audio and then your video will jump forwards and backwards to match as, it, as needed. Um, another, another thing for the systemization is um, a black burst generator, and this has actually uh, gotten quite a bit of interest in the whole industry lately, where we can extract a 270 megabit color black signal from PTP within the device and then feed that out to use as a local gen lock. So either within the equipment of the, of the OEM product, you can use that to time everything internally or have that feed out to an output um, as a gen lock output of the manufacturer's product to synchronize like a local camera. You know, so if you have a local production system, which is an island in itself, you can have a local genlock signal right there to, to keep that island in time. And uh, so that's, that's been, you know, um, very, very popular. Um, all of the management features, synchronization, um, I don't think we need to go through all of this, it, uh, the read solemn forward error correction on 25 gig ethernet, of course, the audio mapping, 
Um, again, you have four streams of audio, uh, and then each of those can be 16 channels, and those can be freely remapped any way you want, both on the in-cap side and on the de-in-cap side. Um, in addition, uh, we do offer a evaluation board. So for the OEM manufacturers that uh, want to get started, um, the evaluation board basically has the system on chip module, uh, SFP cages for your network, um, SMA adapters to come out to your, you know, to your test equipment. Um, and it's pretty much just so that the, the equipment manufacturer can do their own PC board design work and start on their software integration in parallel. You know, so you don't have to wait till you have your board up and running and working uh, before you start your, your software integration process. You can kind of do that in parallel by using the, the, the evaluation board. And this comes with all of the tools, uh, code samples, um, uh, you know, reference designs, um, uh, Gerber files and schematics, pretty much everything that you would need to, to get this integrated into the, into the manufacturer's product. Um, again, you know, relative, like, like I said, it's, 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 it's relatively simple just to, just to see what the size of it is here. Um, I, I don't think there's really anything there, but the, the next slide I think is, whoop, oh yeah, the SMA to SFP adapter. So since the, the evaluation board does have SMA connectors on it, those aren't, um, as common in most people's labs, so we do have a, uh, adapter board that can bring that out to a SFP cage. And then from the SFP cage, you can just put pretty much any kind of um, SFP uh, module in there to, to give you the, the, the raw SDI video. But to control the evaluation board, this is kind of where it's a, a, a bit interesting because um, uh, out of USB, then you can come to some SPI um, adapter that plugs in here that gives you your SPI network. And then again, your um, red blue 2022-7, you know, dual uh, networks then goes back to your switch and then you need a power supply. So that really is all of the connections of how you get that board um, connected up and then back to your computer to, to run the sample code and get, uh, get, the, get the integration running. Um, mechanical and power considerations, uh, this, you know, it's a fairly small package and it does consume up to 11 watts of power. So um, it, it might be less if not all the channels are being used or if you're only running 3G video, but you know, we, we typically recommend to plan on the maximum uh, for heat sink design and you know, ambient temperature inside the, inside the product depending on, because every, every, every environment is different. You're gonna have different airflow, different um, you know, internal temperature ranges that the, that the product will be running at. So you almost do always uh, have a heat sink requirement, but the size of that heat sink, the design of it is gonna be pretty much, um, you know, different for the, for the product that it's being integrated into. Um, and then we have, you know, uh, different OEM manufacturers that put this on the main board inside their product, on a mezzanine board, on an IO board that plugs into the back. Um, pretty much any, any configuration is possible. Um, but we have seen that, you know, there's, there's some of these small brick products or small PTZ cameras where um, it, there can be a challenge, both from a, a space standpoint, a power consumption standpoint, and a heat standpoint, where you have to, you know, go through some, some extra hoops to, to jump through to, to get that in integration done. So, I've, tr I've tried to concentrate on, on, on the how. You know, somebody want, uh, an equipment manufacturer wants to have um, ST2110 in their product. Um, so this has been kind of a discussion on how to do that and the why. And, it, and it's again, adding 2110, like I said before, it, it is complicated and not all of the equipment manufacturers out there um, have that expertise in house uh, or have the budget to, or the timeline um, to, to really go through that process, because it's, you know, it, it is a challenge. It's very difficult, it's very complicated. Um, you have an investment not just for the initial implementation, but also to keep up on all the changing standards as, you know, all of the NMOS and um, 
you know, the different control options uh, evolve in the marketplace. So this basically gives the equipment manufacturers a, a simplified way to get these interfaces into their product uh, quickly and cheaply with the, the, the least amount of fuss and um, uh, with a, a minimum of, of engineering investment. And that's pretty much it.